Hey guys, don't forget the 2023 Street Cop Training Conference, Nashville, Tennessee, April 23rd through the 28th. You do not want to miss this so far. Guest speakers, Rob O'Neill, the Navy SEAL that was responsible for killing Osama bin Laden. Kyle Carpenter, U.S. Marine, Medal of Honor recipient, jumping on an IED to protect his platoon. Fox News host Tommy Lahren returns for 2023. Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff Mark Lamb, Sheriff David Clark, and more to come. You don't want to miss this event. We additionally have 20 of the country's top law enforcement educators giving you the best experience of your life. You will leave this event knowing more about your job and how to be proficient at the things that you do, hands down, than any other event that you'll ever attend. I personally guarantee it. Don't miss out. There's a room code at streetcop.com for our room block and room code at the Gaylord at Opry is where the event's taking place. Don't miss out on a discounted rate. The rate is from Sunday to Thursday. Put that in and find yourselves at a half-price room. Split it with a friend, but make sure you get there. You don't want to miss this event. It is going to be that good. If you trust me and you trust Street Cop, trust that you will leave there feeling like you've had an experience of a lifetime. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. We got to get that on a shirt somewhere. I've gotten very good at that. Anyway, welcome to this episode. We have today with us police instructor extraordinaire. Been on the job for a long time. Ancient. Oh boy. <laughs> but none other than... I don't know why I keep coming back. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> or anybody comes back to this place. Heather Glogolich did it good that time. Lieutenant here in New Jersey. And uh, Heather, welcome back to the podcast studio here at Street Cop Training Headquarters. Thanks, Dennis. What has transpired since we had you on last time? Oh, man. Uh, in the middle of a promotional process. That's really been my main focus. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Those are, those are very time consuming. They are. My poor family. Ooh. When you say your poor family, is that because you are feeling stressed out or you're just kind of missing an action? No, I think, you know, as the start of the school year. So there's that. And, you know, my husband just picks up so much slack. And whenever I can, I'm studying. So I feel like an absent mom. Yeah. It'll be worth it, though. If I, yeah. I, I mean, guess. sometimes I'm an absent dad. I don't have a choice to be. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to be in Detroit on Thursday. Yeah. Look, it's part of the deal. You know what I mean? We have a lot of um, luxuries. And I don't want to say that in a sense of, you know, because... My kids are living in Lear jets and flying around the country. That's not the answer. What I'm saying is uh, the luxury of me having the ability to manipulate my schedule to be there as their father. Yeah. So with that comes some trade-offs. Nothing comes easier for free. That's a pretty good lead in today's topic. It is. Very Te- good. Tell us what today's topic is going to be. We're going to talk about balancing being a police officer or working in law enforcement and also being a parent. Why don't you give people context of how many kids you have to start? There's 18 of them, right? About that. Yeah. Four. <laughs> Brad has 18. I have four. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm part of the four club with you and Tom. And Brad is actually hitting the threshold where he actually has to get like one of those shuttle buses <laughs> to drive his kids around. Is he going to get the Benz one? No, I would probably say no. Oh, I would. I mean, if you're going to get gonna, a shuttle bus. He's got to get a shuttle bus. He's going to have to, yeah. You can't fit. The, he was actually talking to me about when I was at his house last time, what kind of car you think you should get. And I said, I don't know, something that holds 18 people. Well, his problem is he didn't time it well, right? You got to time it to where your oldest is about to get their license. And then you have the fifth. How old is your oldest? <laughs> she is 15. She's going to be 16. So I have like a year and three months, four months until she can drive on her own. Mm, she excited to drive. I think she is excited. She's excited for the freedom, but at the same time, she's my very conservative child. She's going to be the one who goes too slow. So I'm more worried about her driving because I don't think she's going to be aggressive enough on the road. Lack of confidence. Lack of confidence. And I think she, she just watches everything, right? She's my kid. So she's the kid who walks down the street and isn't on her cell phone because she's always looking around to make sure if someone's not trying to kidnap her, which is crazy because I probably made my children neurotic and I'm going to have years and years of bills of therapy for them, but it is what it is. Mm. Yeah. I guess sometimes our, our concerns, we have to think about how they affect our children. Yeah. You know what I try not to say to my kids? What? Be careful. Okay. I try to avoid it like the plague. I really do. Because I watch parents do that. Like they're jumping off the dive and we're like, be careful. And I'm like, mm, I don't say that. Yeah. All right. So where do you want to lead in with this? I mean, obviously, start where you want. What do you want to discuss? What are some of the more challenging things about your kids having a parent 
that is in law enforcement, things that other kids probably don't have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, so I have four kids. My daughter is 15, my oldest. My son is 14. And then from my second marriage, I have two kids that are eight and six. And one, it's unbelievable to see how much more patient I am as I get older with the older two. And it's also really interesting to see how much of a better parent I am now that I have a partner to raise kids, right? With my older two, I was a single mom when they were 20 months and eight months old. And it's just been such a different experience raising kids a little bit older and with somebody who's not a psychopath, I guess is the best way for me to put it. But, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we talked about this down in the conference and I got up and, uh, and made mention of how, and I think we talked about this in another podcast too, where when George Floyd happened, people that I had known for a very long time started to not like me just because I had a uniform, even though they knew the person that I was. And I don't think we realize how much it affects our kids too, because they're seeing the stress on my face and they're seeing the things that are on social media because they're old enough to be on social media at 15, 14, 14, 13, however old they were, but they were seeing the hateful things people were saying about cops in general. And, and they know me and they know the people I work with and they know the cops where we live and, and they just don't see us that way. But even girls that I had in my Girl Scout troop that I was the leader for turned and like made horrible comments to my kids and teachers wouldn't call on my daughter in class because she showed up in a thin blue line t-shirt. And, you know, it's amazing to see how much more mature my kids are than every other kid in in retrospect, when I look, I can see that the life that they've had to live has made them mature, which is very difficult for them to navigate, right? They don't have a lot of very close friends that are their age. They don't have the same mindset as far as things that bother other kids. They kind of are like, man, in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing. And so it's a, it's a challenge to teach them how to understand that what's important to other people might not seem important to us, but they still have to give that credit. It's kind of like when we police things, we get so used to things that are really just, man, I just had to do CPR on a two-year-old, or I went to a fatal motor vehicle crash and held someone's skull together, and you're worried about your neighbor complaining about a dog, right? And it's all about balance, and, and we really still have to learn how to be empathetic and sympathetic to other people, even though it isn't a high on our on our list of importance, so. Earlier, you said that your husband made raising children differently, and you know, when you said that, I think about strengths and weaknesses, probably where some of his weaknesses are your strengths and vice versa. Yeah. How, what have you learned from him about his parenting skills versus yours? So what, (laughs) what's interesting is he's nine years younger than me, right? So he was 22 when I met him and I was 31 and divorced with two kids. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And we were engaged after we started dating. Uh, he proposed like less than a year later and we were married eight months after that because he knew he wanted to have kids and I was getting a little older and, and, uh, you know, I didn't want to be an old parent and not that there's anything wrong with that, but just for me personally. And the difference between the way I started this relationship and any other is that I set expectations very clearly because I didn't want to waste his time and I didn't want to waste my time. And I needed somebody who fit not just me, but also my older two kids it was a, so basically he got married and he got a wife and two kids immediately at 24 years old. That's just crazy to me. And, uh, we got pregnant really quickly with Addison and, uh, we had her a month before our one year wedding anniversary. So when he and I started dating, we worked the exact same schedule, which is a Pittman, which is a short week and a long week. So we were always off together. And when we started having kids and, and they were young, we had to switch that up. So he, we worked opposites our entire career up until just recently. And so we had to take off to give each other time. And he is the mom and the dad and I'm the mom and the dad. There's really no gender roles in our relationship. And it's crazy because when I'm working, I come home and food is on the table and dinner is done and the kids are getting ready for bed and vice versa when he was working and I had to do it. And just recently especially with signing on with street cop and working on my doctorate and me always having more and more goals. He is the biggest cheerleader, but I'll be like, I'm so sorry that you (laughs) married 
hate me sometimes because I'm like, I know I never seem settled, right? I'm always pushing. And he's like, no, I, I couldn't ask for a better role model for our kids. And for me, he's like, you make me better by you always pushing yourself to be better. And I am a go, go, go person just like you are. And I'm like, I have 15 minutes here while I'm driving. I'll make that phone no, call. Sure. Or, and, and that's the question I get from everybody, Dennis. Everybody's like, how do you do everything you do? And I joke and I'm like, ah, God gave me four more hours a day than all of you. It's just a secret and you don't know about it. But in actuality, it's really about time management and fitting in what you can and being very meticulous in remembering what you have to get done. So I have a constant to-do list going in my notes and my phone and I just delete delete them as I finish it. But when I have downtime, I circle back when I'm sitting outside of my daughter's dance studio and I know I have 15 minutes, I'm doing a social media post or I'm responding to an email or I'm checking on something. But there are the times where I've really had to learn. And especially within the past year or two with everything I have going on that I have to make that time for quality time with my family. Mm -hmm. It can't just be like, oh, let's just figure it out and I'm going to do this on the side. And, you know, I feel guilty when I pick up my phone at dinner sometimes, but it has to be done. And my kids get it. And it's a really great feeling to be the mom that comes home at night. And they're like, we missed you so much because I'm not home all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how stay at home parents do it. I just don't. I couldn't do it. I would lose myself. I would be miserable. I would be half the parent that I am now. And I love the fact that I am showing my kids that no matter what they want to do in life, as long as they're committed to it and they communicate what they're doing and they make time for anything that's important, that you can be who you want to be. And I think we get so lost as parents in being a parent and making that our primary focus that we forget that we're suffocating ourselves, right? It's that old you go on an airplane and they're like, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first to save someone else. Or I like to tell my kids, you know, today my cup is empty and I have to refill it in order to give you some. It, it's just, it's what I try and preach to my kids and they really do get it. And I think for them, they've realized that self-care is not selfish. And my mom never did any of this. My mom was all about being a mom. That was it. Like she was, it was all about us. She took us everywhere. She was home. She worked a part-time job. She watched kids in our home just so she could be there for us. And she never did anything for herself. And when I started, and I think that was part of my downfall when I got married the first time is I, I didn't leave an abusive relationship because I was more worried about being the parent I thought I needed to be, not realizing that I couldn't be who I was in order to be a better parent. Mm. You know, I think that what I hear is that you're doing the best you can and doing it with love. And this is different than what other people do, but it works for the Global Itch family. And you know, I one time had my mother come over and she passed a comment and she said, um, you guys don't eat dinner together here? I said, we don't. And she goes, oh, yeah, we don't. No, I work. I work till late at night. I go, but every morning we do breakfast, whatever they want. Typically they want the same thing. So it's not that difficult, but... Yeah, I take the time to cook for them. And that's when we spend our most time is in the morning. We sit on the couch with them, sometimes a little late here because I'm spending quality time with these kids. But it doesn't have to look so cookie cutter like everybody else's. And I said to my mother at the time, our life is different. Look around. It's clearly different. I couldn't have the things that I have if I was doing what everybody else did. So yeah, there's it's rare that we get to sit down. I don't honestly, I could count on two hands how many times we sat down and had dinner together outside of going to a restaurant together. Inside the house, less than 10 times. And my kids have been a father for you know, almost nine years now. Yeah. But that's our story. Yeah. There's no rhyme or reason to why we do it that way. It's just how it is at our house. Yeah. And- you know, being a first responder, my husband's also a fireman and then he, he runs, he's one of the people that's a coordinator up at the communication center. So we have a central dispatch and he basically does 911. That's how I met him. He was my dispatcher on my desk. And now he runs fire and EMS for the comm center, but he also just started a tactical dispatch unit. So they go out on like cert calls or big fires or things like that. But he's just such a good leader and not just at work, but also in our family, right? Because he realizes that he has to support other people. Like that's what good leaders do. They don't just do it for themselves. There's got to be something behind it. And I know we talk about husband and wives and, and mom and dad or mom and mom or whatever it is. But it, it really is, if you take that mindset of leadership within where you work and you apply it to your house, you'll see that that servant leadership aspect can be used everywhere in order to make everything better. And 
you know, everybody's like, oh, you're doing all this stuff for you. And and just like you said, it, it yeah, it, it is for me. I really enjoy this. I mean, I love being a part of Street Cop. I've always wanted to travel. This gives me an unbelievable opportunity to be able to do it. But people are like, why are you going for your doctorate? Like you're, you're a dumb cop. I mean, they don't really say it that way, but you know, what do you need your doctorate for? And I started being as an adjunct professor a couple of years ago and realized that as a full-time employee of a higher education institution, my kids will have the opportunity to go to school for free. And I have four kids. That's a fucking lot of money, right? That's well over a million dollars right now. Imagine when they all go. And so for me, I couldn't just be, and I don't want to say couldn't just be an adjunct, but I wouldn't be able to be a full-time adjunct. And I would love to be the kind of person that goes in and takes over a whole criminal justice system and changes the way we do policing on that level, right? Brings it like, I get it. Sir Robert Peel is important to understand the, you know, the, the implementation of policing, but it's a little tiny history part of policing. And we really have to think more forward. So, you know, for me, yes, it's great. It's what I want to do. It's, it's my plan for my future, but it really, it comes down to being a plan for their future too. When you talked about your husband being a leader, um, you know, it's funny because a lot of things you talk about, I guess marriages have similar dynamics in some sense. I may be very much the boss here and the leader here, but when I go home, I relinquish a lot of that to uh, my other half because I think she does a far better job than I do as a mother and parent, and I'm learning from her. It's not that I'm saying I'm a bad dad. I'm just saying, how would I... Let me watch and learn because I think she rarely misses the mark. Very, very good, very good parent. That's a huge compliment. It's the truth. It's really... Yeah, I think everybody knows that too. It's not hard to tell. Um just just a natural gift uh to with kids i don't know maybe the compassion of it but one of my kids said to me you can make the decision you're the boss here this is your house and i went okay let's just back this up a bit <laughs> i don't know where you missed who's the boss here but yeah. it, it is not me i don't know if you and he's well we're scared of mommy i said yeah we're all scared of mommy i'm scared of her too yeah right i pay the bills yeah did i buy this place oh, i bought it you know but I'm not the boss here. I don't own this place. Yeah. I merely pay the bills, boys. Welcome to my life. That's funny. Yeah, it's the truth. Yeah. And um, But I, you know, that's me submitting to allowing her to thrive and not really interfering with how she runs that place. I'm literally uh, just a, just another part of her troops as she's the general, you know? Yeah. You need me to be somewhere, you tell me. Whatever you need from me, da-da-da. And on other fronts, I'm the, I'm the guy in charge. Follow my lead. I know exactly what I'm doing here. Yeah. And for as much as you tell her that she is incredible as a parent, and I hear people tell me that I'm such a good mom, there is not a day that I don't go to sleep that I'm like, God, I fucked that up today. You know? And I have to look back or, man, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I, maybe I shouldn't have worked those three shifts this weekend because now, you know, one child feels this way or they're having a meltdown at school because they miss their mommy or, or, or those things. And man, mommy guilt is so real. And I, I can't attest to what daddy guilt is. And I know it's out there too, but mommy guilt is real. And I think the, the main point that I really wanted to make sure that I talked about today with you is that there is this underlying bit of anxiety that I have that something on the job is going to leave my kids without a parent and leave them without me. And I love being their parent so much. And we have such a great relationship, me and my kids that I constantly, every single day, try to do everything I can to make sure that they understand that, that I've had a phenomenal life. Like if I was killed in any way, like today, or even driving home, I don't want them to regret my death because I tell them all the time what I do for a living. Like I signed up for this and there's a potential that it could happen. Um, but really it's okay because I'm doing something I love. Like this was my choice. I, I, I chose to put my life on the line and it, whether I get, you know, hit by a car, whatever happens, I just want them to know that I love them so much. And I try so much to give them the tools to be independent and, that's a really shitty balance sometimes because when they don't need me, I'm like, oh God, I need another baby. Matt's like, no. I'm like, but I need another baby. I'm like, they don't need me anymore. They get up, they take care of themselves. They'll let me sleep if I work a night shift. Like even my six and my eight-year-old, they'll take the dogs out. My eight-year-old like does the laundry. She's crazy. Like she could probably watch all four of all, all four kids, like herself and the other three kids, even though she's number three. Mm. She is. Man, that kid is that, I mean, all four of my kids have the potential to be game changers in this world, but she 
gets it at eight years old. She is, you would sit here, Dennis, and she could do a podcast with you and have an intelligent, uh, uh, I'm done. Should have brought it today. So I actually, funny enough, put her on one of my lives on Instagram. And so now we're going to do a whole ask Addison because we had a conversation about like, what do you think it's like for mommy to be a, a police officer? That's she's like, cool. she's like, I'm really just so proud of you. And you know, I worry when things come home, happen at you at work. And I'm like, but you don't know until I'm home. She's like, well, yeah, that's the point because I worry when you tell me, but then I know you're home and it's okay. And she's eight. Like she just, and she's so yeah, articulate. Sure. And I, I mean, I did that. I'm, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I, take, I take full credit with my husband being with me. I mean, my older two, I worry about them all the time. And now they don't see that they're their biological father. I worry a little less, but when they were seeing him, I had to constantly worry about reprogramming mm-hmm. them when they came back mm-hmm. because he's just not the right kind of parent for them. And my son, since he hasn't seen his biological father has like thrived. He joined a sport. He has a girlfriend. He is just engaged in our family now. And it, it's amazing because I was so worried. And I think that's our job to worry about what kind of kid they're going to be. But I was always worried that like my, And you see it. I'm worried my kids are going to get like hooked on dope or they're going to do whatever. And I still want to balance being a cool cop. But I mean, I do I do search and seizures on their room all the time. (laughs) Like legit. I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, you're on your phone. Hand it to me. I pay the bill. And I just check because it's really not that I don't trust them. But kids are cruel, man. And they know it's coming. I pay the bill. Right. That's what it comes down to. Like you live in my house. I pay your bills. Uh, So they're subject to search and seizure at any time. And it's not because I don't trust them and I I want them to be kids, but it's because I don't trust other kids and they're mean. They're just really, really mean. Kids are fucked up. And I worry that, you know, my, when my daughter's depressed and she's, and she's in your room, she's going to kill herself. Like I were not that I have an inclination she's going to, but I'm worried about it because kids just are right. And just like I worry about my guys at work when they go through something traumatic on a scale, I worry about the same thing with my kids and haven't, haven't had that conversation with your son. You know, he is sorry, Hunter. I love you, but he's, he's got an, a girlfriend and she's adorable and I love her. She's just so sweet. Like almost, I wish they had met older, lo- like later in life because yeah, the like later this working out is like slim to none. A hundred percent. And I just adore her. She's so sweet and uh, she's just awesome. Guess and, what? Mom doesn't get to pick his wife though. Unfortunately. No, I get it. Yeah. I get it. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, okay, so, uh, no dick pics, dude. And he's like, what? And I was like, don't ask her to be in a bikini. Don't ask her to send you anything. Don't send anything in your boxers. I was like, absolutely none of it ever, no matter what. And he's like, I know I got this in school. And I was like, I don't care. I've seen it from the law enforcement section. I'm like, don't do it. I was like, I don't care. It can be misconstrued. You never know what could happen. She's nice now, but what happens if you guys break up and she shows like a new boyfriend, like don't, he's like, I can't believe we're having this conversation. You're the only mom that'll have this conversation with me. I'm like, no, I'm not. I go, I might be the smartest mom then if that's the case because I'm protecting you I'm like always ask I'm like I'm gonna give you a written consent form to do anything with her when you're older like (laughs) like I'm that mom he's like you're being a little crazy I'm like I worry right that's my kid like I'm worried about something happening to my daughters but I'm worried about my son being accused of something that he didn't do it's an interesting balance (sighs) sucks yeah it's an interesting balance so for me like it's at my kid's age the equivalent of okay I have a I have a five-year-old that rides a a Phoenix 200 quad. Yeah. And I don't know if people know, let me paint a little picture for you. It's a big fucking bike. Yeah. And he's on it and he's good on it. He's been on him since he's two and a half. But when you say that you're worried about your kids and you have to say something, I mean, I worry too on different, on different fronts. Uh, I just try to really pick and choose when I express myself. And I always try to put thought into, you know, what I'm saying to these kids and, and are they receiving it well? And I don't get it right all the time. Earlier, I just want to go back to this. You talk about mommy guilt. Mm. And then you said, I don't know what daddy guilt's about. Well, I think people have daddy guilt, but I'm going to tell you this first thing that came to my mind. I wrote this down. I don't have daddy guilt because I'm doing my best. I don't have guilt because I'm not wasting any time. It's all precious. And I said this before in the previous podcast. I was talking with somebody else. It's a constant balance for me. As long as I know I tried my best to be there for the baseball game, Sometimes I can't make it, but if I can and I don't, that will give me daddy guilt. But being able to get somewhere, I'm not willing to trade off. Today I got one at six o'clock. I'm not trading off that six o'clock game today to do an extra hour of work here. I'm just not doing it. Yeah. And I've heard that from a lot of people. When I first started having kids, my next door neighbor, Paul, he said to me, um, you've been working like 18 hours a a day since I was, he goes, I missed their entire childhood. So we got this house, we're here, did it up a lot, right? It was 
that part of it. He's like, but I missed the whole thing. I was doing six, seven days a week at work. I missed yeah. everything. He goes, and I, I can't get that back. He goes, so I'm desperately trying to make up for it now as they're teens going into adults. He goes, but dude, I missed it all. And he said that. And then somebody else said something similar to me. And I went, I will take 20, 30, 40% less on this company in growth because I need to make sure that my kids say at the end of my life, I always tell people on, on my headstone, I wanted to say he was the best dad. That's all. Mm-hmm. You're not going to put like the guy who changed law enforcement, none of that bullshit, right? Just he was the best dad. Yeah. Tom and Roberto, he was the best. He was the best dad. Because they have the best mom. They have the best mom. There's They they fucking lucked out. They have the best mom I've ever seen in my life. And they lucked out. Woof, did they luck out. But I got to make sure that I'm the best dad too. Yeah. You know? There's this thing that goes along with being a mom though that's different than being a dad. And I, I really hate to say this, but traditionally there's the gender roles, right? It's the mom that is going to the PTA meetings and is the room mom and all these things. So, you know, it's, it's nice to see it evolving. I hate to, you know, I, I, I get really aggravated when I hear the term working mom, like you, you're, you work and you're a mom, right? You have working dads too. They do the same thing. But for me, like the mommy guilt comes from me knowing that I have the potential to make a ton of money if I work overtime and then having to miss things because of it and them turning around and be like, yeah, we don't really need that Christmas present. We would have just rather you be there. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but it really isn't just about that. It's about making sure we have extra money in case you break your tooth again and I have to pay out of pocket for it or, or things that they just aren't understanding. So we started to do, well, I started to do this thing a while back with my kids called vision boards where they put some things that they want as goals for the family, like, or if they want to go on like a mommy daughter day and what they want that to be. So when I'm not there and they're missing me, I try to tell them, well, look at your vision board and realize that I'm working for that. Right. And then obviously you just have to follow through with it. But, you know, I think the biggest guilt is going to come when, or it does come when they're like, we want our mommy there or they're calling me and they're crying at night or they're like, we wish you were here. We wish you didn't have to go to work. I'm like, well, I wish I didn't have to go to work too, but I married for love instead of money. So I'm sorry, guys. You know, you got the dad you got because I made the right choice. It just is what it is. Marrying for love is the only way to marry. Um, I don't think, I think <laughs> I always tell people this. You I know, make my people, own money. Yeah. Well, people here have asked me questions of a younger crew and I'm like, the likelihood of you marrying somebody who's wealthy is slim to none. So just drop that whole fucking concept. <laughs> yeah. When you marry somebody and they have money, that's a bonus that not many people get. That's just the bottom line. But back a little bit beforehand, you know, it's interesting. I'm fortunate enough where their mother actually is really a great boy mom. I have three boys and a a girl, right? So um, she's much more of a man than I am at times. (laughs) And namely when it comes to creepy critters and crawlers and... she loves that shit. Okay. She'll grab anything, touch anything, hold... You know, we get frogs. We're we're close to the woods, so we get frogs. And she's like, going to hold the frog. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> we go fishing. I'm like, you want to bait these hooks or I'll just, right, I'll help I love them. If, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a good balance for me because I'm trying to give them the things that I have to offer them. And I feel bad at times. I'm not a sports nut. I can play sports. Um, I was always, maybe compared to every other kid, a seven when there were some tens. I certainly wasn't a five. I was just in the middle, uh, sports athletic type of person. But um, my kids aren't hell-bent on playing sports and doing sports. I have one that's really good at baseball. He's the same one who rides the quads. Uh, the other one's a brain, right? Yeah. Uh, the other one I haven't quite figured out yet. But the I, I just say, you know, I'm going to – I can't change who I am for them. I can't right. sit here and try to pretend to watch football on a Friday with them. I'm sorry, on a Sunday with them. Put it on yesterday. I asked the one, I'm like, you want to watch football? He didn't want to watch boat racing, right? Cool. Which is more my speed. Okay. Right. Like I'm into like that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, I'm not not manly. I just don't watch traditional sports, but I'm like, I'm the dad who's like, yo, let's go rent a boat and go water ski. And let's go like, do you guys want to go to jet skis? Yeah. We just went down to Delaware kayaking with the kids, Yeah, which was awesome because we put the older two in a kayak together. And I I really thought I was going with four kids and leaving with three. Whoo. Talk about having to get people to do teamwork, put two teenagers together that are a year apart that are the opposite gender and absolutely can't stand each other. (laughs) That was was fun time. I'm like, get away. I'm like, just go away from me. Go down the rapids. And I had the youngest with me and my husband had the other one. And it's funny because we always joke. I'm like, today, you're my favorite. 
tomorrow it could be you, but you guys have to earn that. It's, it's my big joke with all of them. I think they all think the youngest is my favorite though. Like my baby. Cause she's my baby. And I love them all for different reasons. I love them all equally. I don't, I don't, have- I don't, I don't love I can't say I love them all equally. I, I love them all for who they are. Differently. Yeah. Like it's differently. Like there's different, like Amber made me a mom and then Hunter made me the mom of a boy. And then Addison was the one who blended our whole family together by bringing us all together when Matt and I got married. And then Hadley's my baby. And what's funny is her name actually means from a field of Heather and boy, is she me? Like she is competitive and she is like rough and tough. And she is, I mean, I don't think I'm funny. She's funny. She just comes out. She's quick witted. She is the first person to throw a swear word. You and I were talking about that. She's just hysterical. She just, oh man, I love that kid. And she's a really good leader already because she knows how to already be a follower too. Mm -hmm. Like when to step back. And it just, it really impresses me to watch her. She, so she broke her collarbone in July and she's in jujitsu. And I did it because, I did it because I really wanted her to have a skill that I thought that she would be able to excel at. She's not a dancer. My other two girls are dancers. She's not, she's just not that girl. Uh, she'll get dressed up every once in a while, but she is not that girl. And so I was like, screw it. I don't want to go through Taekwondo again. I did that with Hunter. Uh, and so I put her in jujitsu and she broke, she breaks her collarbone in July. She fell out of her bunk bed. It wasn't even jujitsu. Oh right? my God. Yeah. You should just lie. I, I'm not going to no, mm. because, which is funny because no, I'm not going to lie because she doesn't get hurt in jujitsu yet. Right. That's what I say. She's too good. No, but, uh, she falls out of her bunk bed. She gets a concussion. She's like, she doesn't cry at all. And I go to like pick her up and she winces and I, and me and my husband are both like, now if it was the dog, my husband would have been going crazy and would have lost it. Would have been crying and like, I don't know what to do. Right. But with him, he just, or with her, he just jumped right into, okay, we're going to go to the hospital. And we were both calm and we went and completely snapped. And so she's out of jujitsu. We go, we go to, we go to the, we go to the doctor and we're sitting there and he's like, he's like, all right, about three weeks she has to wear it and then she should be okay. I was like, so she does jujitsu. He's like, yeah, no jujitsu for like at least three weeks. And she goes, well, this is fucking bullshit. Right. <laughs> doctor and I was like oh my god and so I had to record it when we went back in the car but she's just like she was so mad and she she wanted to get back so bad and like she just went back this week I kept her out an additional three weeks because I just wanted Mm -hmm. to make sure and she's just she was so in it to win it she was so focused and so much so that the coach just asked for her to compete so she's going to compete in her first one on Sunday and you know you talk about wanting to make sure that your kids, you know, aren't forced to do anything they don't like to do. Like I'm so stoked. She's obsessed with that. And I'm so stoked. She's obsessed with soccer. Cause I always wanted to be a soccer mom. Cause I played soccer. It's actually how I got injured. Like with all my knee problems. Um, but it's, it's just, and now my son's in cross country and my daughter, like, it's just so cool to see them find like their niche and the thing that they like love and, and to be able to be there to support them. I'd, I'd much rather be at that live than sit there on a Sunday and watch football, mm-hmm. you know, or, or go kayaking down the Delaware, which was amazing. Cause she's in there and she kayaked the entire time, like three hours. She's sitting in front of me and she's like this and we're going and we're going past people and we're right in flow together. And, and we're passing people and they're like, Oh my gosh, look at this little kid. She, Cause she's so short. She's got my two youngest have this bright red hair. And I know you have redheads too. People stop and they're like, oh, do you dye it? I'm like, yes, I dye my fucking six-year-old's hair. Yes, that's what I do. I'm that mom. It's like walking around with celebrities. It is. And then they go to touch them. I'm like, don't touch my fucking kid. (laughs) Like, thank God for COVID. It stopped everybody touching everybody. But like, I'm like, why are you touching my fucking kid, man? But uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard to balance. I can't wait for you to see your kids grow even more into their own personalities and then be able to really articulate like there's this transition where they come, they're not little people anymore and they're almost like, but they're not adults and you have to be like, okay, now's where I start to balance a little bit more of being able to be objective and not so parental. You said before that your kids have said they'd rather have you here. Yeah. Yeah, I I hear that too. I think it's natural. I think kids want to, be with their parents all the time, especially when their parents are good, especially when other people. So I, I've said this before in the podcast, but like I take the pulse of the kids in the neighborhood. I'm like, who's, uh, <laughs> whose house is the most fun? Actually, a lot of the parents would be like, my kid wakes up in the morning and wants to be at your house. The one girl around the corner from me, I said to her yesterday, I go, you, want, you just want a room here? Do you want me just, and she's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. She literally <laughs> doesn't leave. She's 11 and she she's like their sister. Yeah. She doesn't leave the house. And they're, you know, 
their parents are like she literally wakes up in the morning just says I'm going to the Benino house. Oh. Yeah, well we're the fun house. Yeah. Like I there's get it. there's almost no rules and we've got a lot of toys. Uh but a lot of times people will I remember going to the power sports place and the same kid that I'm friends with sells me all the, the bikes that we have. He's like, Bro, you're 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 like the best dad. He's like, Do you ever Aww. stop buying shit? And I'm like, You say I'm the best dad. Some of me's like Maybe I shouldn't buy all this stuff. Yeah. Because now the one, the little one, he's five. He comes over. The one who's driving the quad. He's like, Dad, um, we need to go and uh, like we have to like. I think I need to get a dirt bike next. Like we'll go to the bigger <laughs> ones. He's like, yes. I, I, I'm like, yeah, I maybe start with smaller. He's like, no, no, like the one. He's like, I really think that's where I'm going next with is like dirt bikes. And I'm like, okay. He's like, so can we go now? I love and it. And then I just see like the look over, like, where would you like to put a dirt bike? Yeah. Right? Like, where would you where would you like to put a dirt bike? You're gonna go buy another fucking dirt bike? <laughs> like every time I hear that you're at that place, I get worried. What yeah. are you gonna come home with? So I always take pictures and try to mess her up a little bit. Like, oh hey, go look at this thing. I, I I'll literally show you the text <laughs> of me sending her pictures. Yeah. That's actually how I convinced her because I surprised her was a video. You see the video when I got her a puppy for her thirtieth birthday, my wife? Yeah, yeah. So how I convinced her to surprise her, I'm like, hey, get the kids ready on the front lawn. And I sent a picture of a like this dune buggy. I'm like, I just picked this up. She's like, Are you fucking serious? <laughs> really? This is what you had to do? Yeah. Uh, but I ended up coming home with the puppy. It's a, it's good a video. really cute video. Yeah, it's a good video. It really is. I I challenge anybody to watch that video and not get a little choked up. I get, I got a little choked up. I'll have to show you that one, Frank. No, I actually probably cried. I cried everything. Oh, do yeah. Oh yeah, I'm a crier. It's a video to make you cry a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You strike the right chord. You start connecting to something else. It'll get you. Yeah, we were talking before on the podcast before, so I got a little choked up. People's great emotions come out when they talk about things that they're very passionate or that are very near and dear to them. So when I can identify that as an interviewer, I try to go right for that to see if I can get them to uh, really, really bring the great stuff out. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, we don't have much time left. Let's talk about a few things that people who are cops, who are going to be parents, should know. And then I'll also say people who are cops, who are parents things that they can relate to if you've gotten through it and you can give them advice on how you got through it at that time. So let's start with people who are cops that are going to be parents. What's some advice you have for them? Don't hide what your job is and how hard it can be. That's, that's my biggest, I need my kids to see that I'm a human and things affect me the same way as people who have been through it. I mean, you know, we all get desensitized sometimes from things in this job, but I have really hard days and, and I don't know how to do everything at all. And I just, I want my kids to see the struggle, right? So they'll see me studying for my captain's promotion and they're like, Oh, you're going to get it. And they're really trying to be motivating to me and supportive, but I have to, I have to be honest with them and be like, yeah, but I might not. So I, I need you to understand that also, right? Like it might, I just might not, I don't want them to always see that everybody wins. Uh, when it comes to my kids, I've just, always been very honest about the fact that we don't leave the house angry at each other. Like we can be upset about things, but we, there's an, I love you. Or there's a text saying, have a great day. My oldest daughter, it, it doesn't matter when it is, but throughout my shift before I leave, it's, I always get texts from her that say, come home safe. And I love you and be safe because she could be pissed at me for whatever. I could be pissed at her. But at the end of the day, we, you don't, you can't, I mean, they could be at school and something could happen to them. Right. And it's just, it's open communication. You walk out of my house and there's a sign that says, come home safe, like on three books that says there. So for them, the real the, the realization of what their parents do gives them more anxiety than most. So I really have to make quality time instead of quantity time and realize that that's enough, right? That's what we were just talking about. And I just never wanted to be pigeonholed as this stereotype of what I needed to be in any area of my life. So I I've never held back and I, and I try to show them the same thing, but you have to let your kids tell you that things are hard too. And that was something I had to grow through, right? They'd come home and they'd tell me things that bothered them. And again, I was at a place where I don't think I was very, empathetic to them. And I was like, you'll get through it. It's just a girl thing, or it's just a mean girl, or those kids don't matter. Or, you'll realize in life that, you know, these people in high school don't matter, but right then in the moment it does matter and it is affecting them. And I have to learn to not blow it off. And I have to learn to put that time aside and put my phone down and not every call is that important. And, uh, it's just really about balance. That's, that's, I mean, that's the greatest gift of advice I can give to anybody is learning about balance. 
How about this? How about trying not to be a cop with your kids and your family? Oh, that's really hard. I mean, really hard. I mean, there's there's some things that have happened in my personal life that not my immediate family. Well, my immediate family with like parents and my brother and, and everything. And, you know, that's his story. So I don't want to talk about it. But you feel compelled to take certain action when you have to. Right. And with my kids, with knowing everything that I know that can happen to them, I try to be the parent that's aware and not the parent that's the cop. That, that's the best way for me to put it. Like, I don't like, you know, if, if my kids want to learn what it's like to, to get buzzed or, or get drunk, like I, you know, I don't care. Everybody's going to have a different opinion, but I want that to be with me, like, because I want to protect them. And I don't want them to be at a party where she gets, you know, too drunk because she's had two white claws and she don't, doesn't know what it's like. And she gets taken advantage of. So, you know, it, it depends on how you want to define being a cop, but you, you don't want to be that asshole cop that your parents, that your kids don't like, that you're constantly up their butts. But yeah, I will do spot checks on their rooms and I will do, but I encourage all parents to do that, right? You got to be present in your kids' lives. And that's not just being their best friend. Like you have to be a parent. You have to be able to parent them. It's, it's like having a squad of people that you don't want to train and you don't want to give education to. Like you just let them go run amok out on the street and do whatever they want. And they, you know, not using things the right way. It's the same thing with your kids. There's a difference between a, being a best friend and being a parent. And you can be a friend and a parent at the same time, as long as they know that me being a parent comes first. I don't need you to like me. I just need you to respect me. And I need you to know that no matter what, I have your back and I'm going to do what's best for you. Are there certain things that trigger your Fourth Amendment violations of your children? <laughs> they don't have any rights in my house. I'm There's just saying. Bill like, rights do not apply to my children. <laughs> I was just saying, like, is there something that you're, you're looking for? I mean, that you, or is it just your anxiety that's driving it? No, I mean, really, it comes down to their phone. It's a dangerous place, the phone. It is, man. When we were kids, like a bully had to call a phone that was attached to the wall and ask my mom, can I speak to Heather, please? And then bully me over the phone, right? You got reprieve when you left school from the bullies or wherever you were. Our kids have no reprieve. Mm. They don't have any off switch. They can be attacked 24 hours a day. And, or even just looking at images of the things that they feel that they don't live up to and how that really affects who their psyche is and their mental and their emotional state. So yeah, I'll, like if I see my kids are down or I know something's going on or whatever, I really, I don't do it anymore. It's, it's been a while since I have, when my third gets a phone, I will, because I, I, I want them to realize that I need, like if I looked at my son's phone the other day and I found out he went out his window and sat on our roof hmm. without, I'm like, bro, I don't care that you're on the roof, but let me know. Cause if you fall and you get hurt, I sleep, I, I'm sound sleeper. I'm not going to hear it, bro. You're going to be in the cold. It was like new year's. I'm like, dude, it's 12 degrees outside. Like, what are you doing? It's her, I was on FaceTime. I was like, okay, whatever. Oh man, I love that kid. You know what's funny about him? He's now to the point where like, he knows I can't be mad at him if he hugs me and I hate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll be like trying to be mad at him about something and he'll just come up, but I love you. And he hugs me. I'm like, woof. so this is what it's like to be a mom boy or a, a mom of a boy. Oh man, he kills me. But there's things I don't want to say because my daughter is going to hear this and, and she'll be embarrassed if I say it. But, you know, there are things that some of their friends will do or I will find out about or, you know, things that they're a part of because they're not perfect and I don't expect them to be. And I want them to fuck up. Right. Like I want them to learn from their mistakes. They can't just learn from my lessons. They have to make mistakes. But, you know, once trust is broken, it has to be earned back. So that's where they're fourth. Amendment rights get okay, questioned. <clears throat> I um I think about that a little bit because I think that yeah you know, I'm not really fond of the way my parents raised us uh, in many senses, and I I felt like there was some uh, unwarranted intrusions under the, under the Fourth Amendment in, in my house. Uh, my father was a complete and you know he, unfortunately man's not well anymore, but uh, it was a, it was like a complete dictatorship, which essentially made me resent them pretty much my whole life yeah, and have to find some peace to try to, uh, you know, find some forgiveness for the things that I was put. And the crazy thing is their perception was we didn't do anything wrong. Right. Like, yeah. But in at 40 going on 41, I can tell you that knowing I'm a parent, maybe your intentions were, were correct. The execution was a problem. And you have to think about the the position that your children are in and how they're perceiving you. And you've got to constantly communicate with them of why, you mm -hmm. know, why. Yeah. And I don't think flying off the handle is a, is a great way to handle a lot of things. 
I'm reminded by their mother that sometimes my approach to addressing the situation is not optimal. And I apologize. Don't apologize to me. Apologize to them. Yeah. And with that being said, how do you think your kids perceive you? You want to ask them? What do you think they would say? <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I think that they- I think it's a good question. Before you answer yeah. that, I think it's a good question that everybody should ask themselves. Yeah. It's a really great question. And I constantly ask it of myself because I don't want them to hate me. There are times that they're going to hate decisions I make. I think I'm very fair. And we don't have a whole lot of rules at our house either. Let us know where you are. Let us know what you're doing. And- let us know what's going on. That's really just what it is. And I mean, obviously like don't steal alcohol and get drunk like this, you know, that kind of stuff and and be present, right? That like no phones at the dinner table. Those are like our rules. And I think they believe that I'm a little stricter than most, but I'm also the cool mom, right? Mm -hmm. Like all their friends think I'm like, what your mom does is so cool and, and that kind of stuff. But my relationship with my oldest has, is unique. Uh, because we're evolving into her being a young woman. And so there's more things for us to relate on now. And she'll think that I don't care. And I, that's, she's the one that I constantly reevaluate my parenting style with because she's so opposite of me. She's so much more emotional and she takes on so much and she feels everything. And she just really is very guilty when other people feel bad, but at the same time, she just, allows her emotions to overtake who she is and how her day goes. And I'm just like, okay, that happened. I can deal with it. I can go through. So that's where we butt heads. And that's where I think my parenting style has had to evolve because I needed to adapt my parenting style to the child she is instead of trying to make her adapt the way she is as a child Mm -hmm. to my, to my parenting style. Mm -hmm. And I've learned so much from her and I constantly learn. And, you know, Hunter, we had a really strained relationship for a while because it, when he went to his dad's, he wasn't allowed to love me. And that had to be a lot on him. And I didn't really even know it until I saw him not have to go there anymore. And now our relationship is phenomenal. I mean, like it's better than I could have been. And and him and I work really well together. He gets aggravated when I'm kind of up his butt about like taking his medicine that he has to take, or, you know, did you do your homework or man, you got to get up in the morning. And it kills me when I have to wake him up seven times, but it's the little things. And my little two just, idolize me. Like they're just at eight and six, like I'm the equivalent of whatever they think. Jojo Siwa, I guess. I don't know whoever Mm. they love right now. I mean, if it was Hadley, it'd be Black Panther. That's her favorite person in the world. But they just, they think that I am the the coolest and I'm a better parent to my younger two than I was to my older two by far. You learn. You learn, but like, I just. You're also different now than you were at 31 or whatever you were. Yeah. Uh, 26, 27, 28. I mean, that's how I will. Yeah. And you're a different person. That's why. Yeah. And I think my older two see that they see that I am a better parent and I'm, I don't deny it. Right. I think if I denied it, I would not be allowing them to feel what they're feeling and feel valid about that. think You're different now. You think you're more relaxed. Oh my God. You understand it better. I'm not a single parent. I'm not straight. I mean, when I was a single parent, I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. Like I went without food for days so I could put $5 of gas in the car to make it to work. I had a car that broke down because I couldn't afford it. I was late on rent because I I was a single mom at, at base pay with two kids that I had, you know, I, I just, that's a lot of stress. And I don't think I was as self-aware as I am now, right? I, I put a lot of work into being a better person overall, which in turn makes me a better parent. But being aware of understanding where my shortcomings are and, and not having an ego about them and realizing, yeah, I'm not perfect and I could do that better. And and listening to my kids, even if what they're saying to me is unrealistic and from their perspective, which may be wrong uh, and just they're like one sided. I have to realize that that's how they're feeling. And that's what they're they're, And that's my biggest issue with my daughter, my oldest with Amber. She just, you know, she's obviously a teenager and she's tough. That that's a tough age. And she's dealing with a lot and she's one sided in how she sees how I act and react towards her. So it it comes down to having a very long drawn out conversation about where I'm coming from and why, and understanding where she's coming from and why, and us, both letting go of our perspectives and trying to see the other person's perspective, mm-hmm. which I never thought I'd have to do with a 15 year old. Right. I just, I, 
I, when I was 15, my mom would say, sit down and shut up. And I'd say, yes, ma'am. Right. Like you're at the dinner table. Don't talk. Like you talk about it being a dictatorship. And my mother wasn't a dictator, but back then it was like, children should be seen and not heard. Like do what I say, because I said to do it. There was no why we never asked why back then. And you know, it's just, it's evolved into understanding who your kids are and understanding who you are. And it's just different parenting. I'm never going to be a helicopter parent. I just, the worst by the way. Yeah. I just, I I don't, I, okay, deal with your feelings. Like I'm not a referee. I can't fix everything. I'm, I'm your parent. I'm not a referee. I'm not a psychologist. I am your parent. And while I can try and pull some of that in and, and help you in the ways I can, I'll give you the resources to make it happen. But I don't want to raise somebody who can't make their own decisions and can't deal with their emotions and who doesn't have the resources to be the best human they can be on their level, but I'll give them what they need. And it's, it, that's, that's, what's been really hard because transitioning from knowing how I would handle something and having an expect expectation of them handling it the way that I do had to get lost. Like I, I can't expect them to be me and I can't expect anybody to be me. I'm like, I'm on a hundred all the time. And if 70 is their best, I have to accept that because that's their best. Mm-hmm. I just, it's, it's hard. It's four different personalities that I'm constantly trying to balance while, and the real mommy guilt comes in from me not giving each of them a good amount of time separately. It's a lot of, I'm always doing things with either all of them or two of them. And I think I really have to put effort into giving them some one-on-one time too, because they deserve that from me. I just wanted to clarify something before. I know that I said that we don't have rules at my house. Let me just back that up a little bit. We have rules. My kids are actually some of those well-behaved children you ever see. Uh, I don't put a schedule or a cap on their excitement. Yeah. So if they're like, yo, uh, we want to ride quads. And I'm like, okay, let's go. I don't yeah. care what I'm doing. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Can we ride quads now? Yep, sure. We want to go swimming. Yep, no problem. What are you doing? It doesn't matter. I'll get my bathing suit on. I can work from outside or whatever it may, may be. Um, you know, we try to make it enjoyable, but there are rules. I mean, they're not going to just come in and completely misbehave or misbehave with anything. Uh, but, you know, for us, it's, uh, can we go to the beach tonight and watch a movie? Sure. Yeah, what do you guys want to do? Whatever. That's That's what I mean by... I think other parents are essentially at some point don't like to get outside of their comfort zone. They want to do what they want to do. And me, I'm just ready, willing, and able to do whatever you want to do. Uh, As long as it's, you know, within like, usually I'm the guy provoking it because I'm a giant child. So I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, yo, it's three o'clock. Hurricane Harbor's still open. Let's fucking get moving. Yeah. And they're like, we, I'm like, let's go. They're open for another three hours and get on like three or four rides in that time. Let's go. Let's rock and roll. Yeah. I just, I'm like, you guys want to just go to the the boardwalk? And like, one will be like, I don't want to go. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't care. Then you could stay home with the dog. And they're like, well, I don't want to do that either. I'm like, well, the other option is far better. You can come to the boardwalk with us and go yeah. on rides. No, I knew what you meant about rules. Like there, there aren't unnecessary rules. There are things to guide your children to be better humans and to give them parameters because they, they can't not have some kind of rules. does a great job at that. You know, it's really, we, we really are on a, on a unbalanced time with, you know, she's, she's a work, she stayed home. So, you know, really I, I relinquish a lot of that off to her. She does a phenomenal job. Um, and sometimes I even need guidance on it. I'm like, what am I supposed to do in this scenario? Yeah. What do I do? Who's right? Who's wrong? I don't want to make the mistake. You know, sometimes she'll let me fall on my face a little bit. She's like, well, that was the wrong decision. I'm like, well, that's why I asked, motherfucker. Yeah, right? but like, your your kids have to see you make mistakes too. Like I've I've flown off the handle or I've like said something that I didn't mean. And, and I go back and I'm like, oh man, I was such a dick. And I'll go back and I'll be like, you didn't deserve that. I was wrong. I'm really sorry. Right? And your kids need to see you apologize. I, I do that. A hundred percent. I do have a rule at my house. There's no slime. There's no slime oh, and there's no glitter. Pay attention, Frank. No slime, Frank. The glitter's one thing. The slime. <sighs> Write it down. You know, you can do a, a negotiation. You can negotiate down to Play-Doh. Even yeah. Play-Doh sucks. Hardwood only, man. Like yeah, well, no rug stuff. Play-Doh no. in the kitchen. Yep. Watch out for ice pops. Those will get you. <sighs> oh, yeah. The, the, but the, but the, the slime is Slime bad. is the worst. I hope people found value in this. Some people who have kids... Maybe got a little perspective. I think some of the key points that we talked about are important here. And, you know, some of those, just to reiterate, are how do your kids see you? Yeah. Are you being the best you can for your kids? And are you showing up with what you can? What I mean by that is, is putting on the football game and watching football on a Sunday while your kid plays two rooms over, that's not quality time. Right. Sometimes I even have to put myself in check of like, okay, this one's drawing. Sometimes I sit down and draw with them. Yeah. That's it. And- those moments create this great bond. Even something as simple as that, sitting down, getting to their level and doing something with them. You know, how do they perceive you? Are you spending quality time? Even if you don't have a lot of quantity time to be with them, 
I think that your kids, as they grow up, understand that you're really trying your best. And maybe they don't know that now because sometimes they're cruel too. Yeah. And they can hurt your feelings as children. Uh, but, you know, that's really what you could say at the end. Did I really do my best? Yeah. That's it. I have nothing else. Yeah. I think I also just want them to know that the way they might be feeling is that they're not alone, right? Like it's normal for you to feel like maybe you're not being the best parent by doing certain things. In policing, I think there's so many times that we don't allow people to understand that we understand what they're going through. And that leads to, you know, people being, you know, alcoholics or, or you know, addicts to something else or maybe committing suicide. It's just really like you might be on a struggle bus right now, but there's people out there that are going through the same thing. They feel the same way. They feel like they're not living up to what they're doing as a parent because maybe they're striving for something else. So, yeah, I mean, other than everything you said, I just really want people to understand that they're just not alone and they can balance it and you can make it work. This is a good one. It always is. Appreciate all of you and your continued support. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher, so you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.